Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Prime Minister, you started this campaign with a huge double-digit lead in the polls. It's now down to single digits in some polls. What's gone wrong? Well, Andrew, there's only one poll that counts in any election campaign, as I'm sure you know from your long experience, and that's the one that takes place on the 8th of June, when people have actually cast their votes, when they've made that choice, uh, which is a crucial choice. I think this genuinely is the most crucial election I've seen in my lifetime, because it's about getting Brexit negotiations right, getting the right deal for Britain from Europe, and uh, going beyond that, a plan for a stronger Britain for the future. And I believe that I've set out my vision for that strength in negotiations and that stronger plan. And the choice is, who's going to be doing those negotiations, me or Jeremy Corbyn? So why do you think your lead is narrowing? Well, as I say, the only poll that counts is the one that actually takes place on the 8th of June. And uh, what I'm doing, what uh, I and my team are doing, is going out around the country, talking to people, hearing from them, and uh, talking to them about this crucial choice that the country will face on the 8th of June. Because... You know, so much depends on us getting those Brexit negotiations right. It's not just the next five years, but it's beyond the next five years, our standard of living, our place in the world. And you need a strong hand in those negotiations, and you need strength in those negotiations. And as I say, there's only going to be a choice between two people as to who's sitting opposite those 27 European countries, me or Jeremy Corbyn. But could you be in a little bit of trouble now because you were so sure of winning that you thought you could get away with a load of uncosted and half-baked policies? You know, I've never taken anything for granted about this election. I called this election because I think it is important that the country has certainty over the next five years, has the strong and stable leadership that I think it needs, as I've just explained, particularly for those Brexit negotiations. And what I saw was that other parties were trying to frustrate and uh, promising to try to frustrate those Brexit negotiations. So I thought it was right to call an election and ask people to make that choice. But your policies I'm... are uncosted and half-baked, aren't they? No. What we have set out in the manifesto is a series of policies which address what I see and uh, I think are the five great challenges that we face as a country. What I've tried to be is to, is to show people that actually if we're going to build that stronger Britain, we've got mm. to be willing to face up to these challenges and fix them. Well, let's look at social care for the elderly. Four days ago, your manifesto rejected a cap on social care costs. Today, you announced a cap. That sounds pretty half-baked. Uh, nothing has changed from the principles on social care policy that we set out in our manifesto. Let me just explain, if I may, why I think it's important, why this is one of the great challenges that we face, our ageing society. Just one figure, in 10 years' time, there will be two million more people over the age of 75. Now, our social care system will collapse unless we do something about it. We could try and pretend the problem isn't there um, and hope that it will go away, but it won't. Uh, it will grow each year. Uh, we could play politics with it, as the Labour Party is doing, or we could show how we can fix it, and that's what I've done. But you say nothing has changed. Jeremy Hunt, on the day you launched your manifesto last Thursday, the health secretary, he said, yes, we are dropping the cap, and we're being completely explicit in our manifesto. We're dropping it. We don't think it's fair. Today, you announced a cap. And Jeremy was talking about the... Of course, Dil uh, Andrew Dilnot had brought forward previous proposals for a cap, but Jeremy also went on to say that what we wanted to have was a system that was fair to taxpayers, that was fair to all generations, and that's what we're doing and crucially but it is the a principles cap, prime minister you crucially. your manifesto rejects a cap it gives a reason why you don't want a cap now you're going to have a cap you need to be honest i would suggest and tell the british people you've changed your mind what i'm doing first of all andrew i'm being absolutely honest with the british people about the big challenge that we face and I'm absolutely honest with them about the need for us to deal with this now to start fixing it now now what i've put forward is a social care policy which means that people won't have to worry if they're sitting there you know, month after month worrying about money coming out of their bank account to pay for their care and worrying how, how long that will last. They won't have to worry because they won't have to be paying during their lifetime. They won't have to worry that they're going to have to sell their house during their lifetime. 
and they'll be able to pass £100,000 on to their families when they die. At least that's a protected £100,000. What I've done today is I've seen the scaremongering, frankly, that we've seen over the weekend. I've seen the way that Jeremy Corbyn wants to sneak into number 10 uh, by playing on the fears of older and vulnerable people. And I've clarified what we will be putting well, in the green paper, so, which I set out in the manifesto. So Jeremy Corbyn is now rewriting your manifesto? <laughs> no, not at all. Well, but that's he, what, what it he sounds is, like. You've reacted is, to him. No, we haven't. But, we, uh, Andrew, we have not rewritten the manifesto. The principles on which we have based our social care policy remain absolutely the same. We need to ensure that we have long-term sustainability in social care. We need to be able to ensure we can fund social care for the future. We've, we're doing the honest thing about putting a proposal to the British people and they will make their choice How on that. How can it be honest, Prime Minister, to reject a cap in your manifesto and four days later say we're going to have a cap? Yeah. We, What's honest about that? What, is, what we set out in our manifesto was a series of principles. It was to say to people, first of all, this is a big issue, we need to address it, and we are being honest that we must fix it, and that's what I want to do. I'm not going to bury my head in the sand, I'm not going to play politics with it, which is what you, Jeremy Corbyn is doing. You're just going to change your mind I'm already. Going to, I'm going to fix it. What I've seen is that people have been worried by some of the things that the Labour Party has been claiming, and others indeed, the Liberal oh. Democrats too, about what our policy means. Uh, in some cases, the complete opposite. But when of Labour what our said you were against means. the cap, they were right until today. You were against the cap. Uh, what we have done is clarified what will be in this green paper. We were very clear here's our social care policy, here is what we're doing. We want to protect people, we want people not to have the worry day to day about being able to pay for their social care. That's why we're what? fixing this problem. This That's why we're putting this into place. This what I have said today is I've heard the scaremongering. I've seen how Labour want to try to sneak into number 10. Jeremy Corbyn wants to try to get into number 10 by playing on fears, by misrepresenting our policy. What we are doing is ensuring people will not have to sell their house during their lifetime. They won't have to worry about those monthly bills for their care. The and they'll be able to protect more money than they have been before. But it's a cap on families. lifetime social costs, which worry people as well. I mean, this must be the first time in modern history that a party's actually broken a manifesto policy before the election. Yeah. What we have done, Andrew, I, I set out in my manifesto the challenges that we need to address as a government. And I've been very clear with people. You know, there are two ways that you can approach this issue. You can say to people, this is, we have an ageing society. Our system will collapse unless we do something about it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You can ignore it, you can put your head in the sand, or you can try and play politics with it. I think it's only fair to people to say this is a problem and we need to fix it now. Right. That's what I want to do. Oh. I want to fix it so people How? don't have the worry can, about right. their can social you, care costs. Now that, you're in favor so of a, now that you're in favor of a cap, can you give us an idea of what the cap might be, that the amount we'll have to pay for social care? What we're going to do, as we said in our manifesto, is publish um, we refer to a green paper, of course, uh, a green paper, many people may not um, realise a green paper a is consultation. a consultation. So we want to take people's views, the views of charities, the views of others, on how the system should be operating. What I've said today so is we that we, will have, the size of the we will have within that consultation uh, mm. that concept of uh, an absolute so, limit on the costs that people have to pay. Finish. So we're protecting people for the future. Right. We're providing a system that provides sustainability in our social care for the future. And we've got an ageing population, we need to do this, otherwise why, our system will collapse. Why did you not the, put the consultation on a cap in your manifesto? Instead, your manifesto rejects a cap. No, what we've put in a manifesto is that we will have a consultation and the principles on which our social care policy will be based. That, I think, was the right thing to do. Right. Now, we will have, you know, if we're re-elected, we will have that consultation. Right. That's... But I think the key issue is that there's a choice here between parties as a choice between Jeremy Corbyn who is playing politics with this doesn't want to address this issue you're not of an aging politics society. With this, Prime Minister? No, I'm not. You came out to. against a cap, you're not in favour of a cap because no. of the backlash. That's not paying no. politics. No. Andrew, what I'm worried about is the way in which there have been fake claims about okay. our policy which are deliberately trying to scare old and vulnerable right. people. Well, you've, you've said what that, I've done is addressed that issue today. And I'm very clear that 
whoever is in government, whoever's prime minister, whether it's me or Jeremy Corbyn, we need to address this issue. We need to fix it. And All that's right. what I'm going to Let do. Let me move on now, because many people have said your manifesto is quite vague when it comes to how you're going to pay for your spending pledges. So let's see if we can get some clarity tonight. How are you going to pay for the extra eight billion pounds for the NHS? Andrew, when I go around the country and talk to people about what we're going to do in government, what people want to know is, are we actually going to have the strong economy that enables us to pay for the NHS and pay for uh, the public services that people want? Now, in our manifesto, we've put some examples of how we're going to change the way money is used. On winter fuel payments, for example, we will means test that, but, but that, money will, go, the extra money that money will the go NHS. into health and social Where care. Where will the extra eight well, billion come from? Andrew, what we have done, if you look at our record, is shown that we can put record sums of money into the National Health Service at the same time as we're ensuring that we're building that strong economy. Mm -hmm. And that's what we'll do for the future. Our economic credibility is not in doubt. Well, it's the Labour Party who's in the dock no, when it comes to economic credibility. No, but the ability to credibility. answer this question may be in doubt, Prime Minister. Let me try one more time. Where will the extra eight billion from the N for the NHS come from? What we have done over the last six years, six, seven years, and what we will do in future is ensure that we have the strong economy, the growing economy, that enables us to generate the funds to put into our public services. Is I've identified in the manifesto some specific areas where we will change the way in which money is being used, and but, I've just referenced... But that's not extra money, that's moving the money will, around. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I've identified... So it's not an extra eight billion? Oh, it is an extra eight billion that is going to go into the National Health Service. But I've identified some areas where we will be changing the way money is used. But crucially, what you need to be able to ensure that you can fund the NHS is the strong and growing economy. As I say, our economic credibility is not on the line. It's the Labour wow. Party that's in the dock on that. Well, They're... the Labour Party have given us costings and given us revenues. You can't give me the, this. Let me ask another way. Well, is, it all Party, new, is it all the, new money? The Labour Party have given you costings which actually don't add up. But at least there's we a 58, can argue about them. There's a £58 billion pound black hole in the Labour well, Party manifesto. Uh, that's the equivalent well, of half the sum we spend on an NHS in a year. Is... What we will do is ensure that we generate, by ensuring we have a strong economy and growth in the economy, we generate the funds and, and just look at our track record. All right. It's what it, we've done over the last few years. Is the eight billion all new money? There will be eight billion more money going into the National Health Service at the end of the at the end of the Parliament. That's a real terms increase per head every year. The manifesto pledges quote the most ambitious programme on investment in buildings and technology the NHS has ever seen. Is that part of the eight billion? No, that's a separate because it's, um, it's the money that you spend on, as I'm sure you know, Andrew, but the money you spend on buildings and, and capital is separate from the money you spend so on a day to day. Where will that money come and from? That, uh, that money will be following. There's a report that was done on the NHS, uh, the Naylor report, which set out what was needed, mm -hmm. and we're backing the proposals in so how the much? Naylor report. It's £10 billion. And where will that come from? That will come from a variety of sources. It's capital money. It's separate from the £8 billion that's going into the National Health Service. Right. But any of this money can only be provided if we've got the strong economy to fund it. And that's, what, and that's where one of the crucial differences between what I'm proposing and what the Labour Party is proposing comes. Because what I'm setting out in my manifesto is the ways in which we can deal with the economy in the Except future. And crucial to that, crucial to that, is getting the Brexit negotiations right. right. And that's why this is so important. That's why who is sitting around that negotiating table uh, that's, 11 days after the election that's the point you've made, going, is going to start. But, but that, I make uh, it again because it's so important but let me come back to the and NHS. crucial to this election. Our hospitals have just endured their worst 12 months in 10 years. A record number of urgent operations were cancelled. A string of targets from emergency care to routine care to cancer care have been missed. What you're promising is too little too late. No. And I accept that the NHS has missed some of its targets. But let's look at, and you know, targets aren't the be-all and end-all. What matters, actually, is the quality of patient care. And let me just give you an example. You mentioned the emergency, accident and emergency targets. And yes, we did see pressure on A&E over the winter. Mm. Now, what matters is not that you tick a box on a target. What matters is you say, what does that tell us that we need to do? But you said and that's why we've already announced that we're going to make some changes. We're putting some extra money already into accident and emergency in hospitals around the country. Because what we see is sometimes people turn up at A&E who don't need to go into hospital, they need to see a GP. 
and by changing the way A&E operates, we can actually ensure that okay. the patient gets the care that they need uh, and that we're seeing uh, hospitals relieved from some of that pressure. Right. That's about ensuring that patient care is what comes first, and that's what we're about. You've ruled out a rise in VAT, but not national insurance or income tax. Why? Because I want to be very clear that as a Conservative Party in government, as we always have been, we're a party that believes in lower taxes. I have every intention of reducing taxes on businesses and working families, uh, but I want to ensure that when we do that, we're able to do that in a sustainable way. So national insurance and income tax could go up? No. I'm very clear that it is our intention to reduce taxes. But and you when, haven't ruled out rises in these two taxes. When, when people come to make their choice on June the 8th, they will see a choice between a Conservative Party that's always been a party of lower tax, has believed in lower tax. Except the and tax burden is now the highest for 30 years under your government. And under my government. The under, highest. Under the Conservative government since 2010, we've seen 4 million people taken out of paying income tax altogether and a tax cut for 31 million uh, taxpayers. But we believe in lower taxes, but we also believe in ensuring that we're developing the strong economy that enables us to fund our public services. But you tried to raise national insurance for the self-employed in the budget a couple of months ago. You were forced to retreat. Can you rule out that you'll try that again? We said we were taking those plans off the table. We have asked Matthew Taylor to uh, do a report on the new forms of employment and we will look at the results of that so report when it comes, when it comes in. But we've, we've uh, removed the uh, proposals that we put in the budget. We've removed those from the but table. But you could bring them back. We need to look at how the employment work market is working at the moment. That's why I'm very clear that I want to put in extra protections mm. for workers. I think things are changing in the way people are being employed, and we need to ensure that we recognise that and right. protect workers. But in all of these issues. We can only do these things. We can only make sure that we're able to lower taxes we, if we've got the strong economy. Fundamental to that, of course, is getting the Brexit deal right and getting those negotiations right, right. and having both a strong hand in those negotiations but also that, the strength of leadership I, I in those negotiations. You, that's the point you've made several times. I want to come on to the just about managing. People who are just about managing. They're not the poorest of the poor but they're, they're not that affluent either. Life can be a bit of a struggle. You say you're on their side, but inflation is now rising faster than average pay, so living standards are being squeezed, and you've frozen their in-work benefits for almost 7 million people. In what way are you on their side? Well, if you look at the issues around uh, people who are, as you say, I mean, I, I talked about people who were just about managing, who sometimes find life a struggle, when I came into Downing Street last year. And there are a number of ways in which I want to support those people. On the cost of living, what I want to see is develop, building a strong economy with higher paid jobs. I also want to help them with things like energy bills, and that's why we're going to cap, rip off uh, energy price rises. But they're but being there are squeezed other things, in income at the, the moment. What way are you on are, their side? You've taken away £280 a year from their in-work benefits because of the freeze. How is that being on but their side? It's, uh, being on their side is about a whole variety of actions that we're taking. Not taking these money are people, away. These are people who want to ensure that their children have a good school place. Oh. That's why we have plans to increase the number of good school places. They do want to ensure uh, that their NHS is being funded. That's why we have plans to ensure that we're putting those record amounts of money into the National Health Service. They want more secure jobs. That's why they building like a strong economy. Pay. They'd like their living standards to well, be I rising. Want, You're squeezing I them. See, I want to see higher paid jobs in okay. this country. Doing that is about building a stronger economy. It's about having a vision for the future. That's what we've got. We've set out a draft industrial strategy, a modern industrial strategy, to really develop the economy across all parts of the country so that we don't see prosperity concentrated in certain areas, right. but prosperity across the whole country. How many pensioners will lose their winter fuel allowance? We, are, we will means test winter fuel allowance, but we again, once again, we will consult, we will ask people, charities, so, organisations, at what level that should be so set. So you don't know, but pensioners watching tonight, they won't know. No, the, no, the very rich, they're going to lose, that's clear. The very poor will probably keep it. But the vast in between, you cannot tell them tonight whether they'll get up to £300 or not this coming winter. What we are doing is going to ensure that the least well-off pensioners <coughs> will have their winter fuel payments protected. But yes, we will consult. I think it's right that we take 
uh, those views of people, of charities, of organisations working with older people and others to look at where that level should be set. But, but overall, in the changes that we're making so and in the policies we're adopting, what I want to do and what I'm going to do is to be protecting pensioners for the future. But you can't tell them tonight or not whether they're going to get their winter fuel allowance or not. It's a vague promise, uncosted, you don't know. No, what I've said is that we will means test winter fuel payments. But I'm this asking is something you where, people, how will yes, you do it? And I've also answered that what we're doing, Andrew, is going to be talking to people about this, asking their views on you where know, this should be set. Not just setting it here in the studio in the Andrew Neil interview, but actually talking to charities and organisations and consulting on it. Wouldn't you have but done overall, that before you came up with the policy? Overall, we will be protecting pensioners. Yeah. You promised twice to reduce immigration to the tens of thousands, and twice you failed. Why should we believe you a third time? What we have done is ensured that we are working to reduce immigration, and crucially, of course, uh, we will, when we leave the European Union, have uh, the opportunity and the ability to deal with the figures to bring in rules for those who are coming from the European Union countries into the United Kingdom. But you've Kingdom. always had we that haven't power. Had that in you've always no. had that power with non-EU migration, and you've never managed to get that down to the tens of thousands. And we've, Even the bit you've controlled, you haven't managed to control. We've seen it come down, and we have seen it's it, still way above and we tens have seen it go up. But there's a very, there's a very real choice here on the 8th of June. It's between me and my party, who believe that we should work to control immigration, and Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party who believe that you should have uncontrolled immigration. But, That's the choice that will be there before people. But, we will continue to work to bring that migration down because we believe it does have an impact on people. But you're not people. bringing it down. It has an impact. Well, the latest Net figures... Net migration is higher now than it was when you came to power in 2010. And the latest figures did see a fall. But you're right, we haven't, got down. we haven't got down to the tens of thousands. We will be able to introduce rules for people coming from inside the European Union when we leave the European Union. Um, but this is an area in immigration, as I've said many times before, uh, where you have to be consistently working at it. That includes looking at non-EU migration as well as EU but migration in the future. Doesn't this go to the heart, Prime Minister, of why people have lost trust in politicians? You make promises, you fail to keep them, but you just make the same promise again. Well, Andrew, I, I called an election several weeks ago. I called an election on this whole issue of trust because the question that people face is who do they trust to take this country through the Brexit negotiations? Who do they trust to face up to the presidents, the prime ministers, the chancellors of Europe and the European Commission? Who do they trust to get the best deal for the UK? They have to decide because it's only going to be one of two people. It's either me or Jeremy Corbyn. And the question for everybody on the 8th of June is who do they trust to get the deal for the UK? The Conservatives promised to end the budget deficit by 2015. It's now going to be 2025 at the earliest. You promised to reduce migration to the tens of thousands. It's still 273,000. On these two big issues, you failed to meet your promises. Why would we trust the Tories on anything else? As I say, the election will be about trust. Yes, we have, uh, we're still the party that wants to ensure that we bring that deficit down. We've brought it down by three quarters. So we've been doing that work and we will continue to work on that. Sharp contrast with the Labour Party that wants to significantly increase borrowing and uh, with a leader who says that he doesn't seem to mind about debt and the deficit. But this, this election... These are big issues, this Prime is, Minister. Yes, the, the budget deficit, how and, we spend and borrow uh, and tax, the immigration, which was a huge issue, as you will know, in the Brexit campaign and so on. On these two major issues, you have failed to keep your promises. And on these two major issues, they are ones that, in sharp contrast with the Labour Party, we are continuing to work to deliver what I believe ordinary people want. I mean, immigration was one of the issues that underpinned that Brexit vote. Indeed. And that's why I come back to the point I made earlier about the election being a matter of trust. And it crucially is who do people trust to sit around that table in those Brexit right. negotiations right. and bring home the best deal George the UK. Osborne says not a single senior member of your cabinet supports the immigration target. Is that true? No. Look, this immigration target is one that we have had over the years, since 2010. In fact, it was developed when the, under David Cameron's leadership in opposition. Um, we've brought it through. What he we says do on the immigration... In your cabinet. People do support the immigration target. What they, and what they're supporting is the view of the British people. 
That's what we're supporting because the British people want to see us controlling migration. We have brought in new rules. We've ruled out a lot of abuse that was taking place in the system, but you have consistently to work at that. Right. We'll get the ability to work at it in relation to the numbers of people coming from the EU, uh, but we're the party. It's, it's me and my party, me and my team, that are committed to saying we want to control migration, whereas Labour want uncontrolled migration. You said last week that Britain faces, I quote, dire consequences if we fail to get a good deal in the Brexit talks of leaving the EU. What sort of dire consequences? Well, I think if you look at what is being said around the, uh, around the whole question of Brexit negotiations, you've got in the, uh, some people in the European Union talking about punishing the United Kingdom. You've got some people here in the UK who are saying that it doesn't really matter what we, what we do, um, we're just going to get any old deal, and, and that's, uh, that's all that we need to do. But what what for will be the future, dire consequences? If we don't get a deal, what will the dire consequences well, be? Well, I've, I've said that no deal is better than a bad deal. So it's not done. Because, because I believe that, as I've just said, there are some people here who are willing to sign up to any deal. Uh, what I want to do, the reason I think, the reason I've said what you've quoted, mm. and the reason I think this is such a crucial part of the question that underpins this election, is that we need to get Brexit right in setting the mm. tone for the next not just five but years, but actually for the future. It's about our economy. It's about mm. all but the things that we want to do in terms of ensuring we work with our European partners. But you haven't told us what... The, I don't understand why no deal can be better than, uh, uh, th th than a bad deal, but no deal would also mean dire consequences, and you haven't told us what the consequences would be. We want to make sure that we get a good deal, which ensures that we can build our economy. I've explained why no deal is better than a bad deal. Because a bad deal is one, as I say, there are those in Europe who want to punish us, and there are those here, politicians here in the United Kingdom, who are willing to sign up to anything. Now, I'm not that I politician. That, but you're not saying that no deal. You're now do, deal. saying no deal means dire consequences, and I'm trying to find out what, the, how dire the consequences will be. Uh, what, I, what I have every confidence is that we will be able to negotiate a good deal with the right negotiating hand. Mm with the strength of mandate behind us to take into those negotiations. And that's what I want to do. That's why the choice on the 8th of June is so important for people. Right. And because if you if win on June the 8th, Prime Minister, if you win, how long will you stay Prime Minister? Well, I'm, uh, I'm Prime Minister until the 8th of June, then I hope that people will feel right. that they can support me for stay? me to be Prime Minister for the next term. You'll stay for the next Parliament? I will definitely stay for the next Parliament. Beyond that, Andrew, I mean, this is, I haven't got through this election yet. I'm focusing on this election. It's really okay. important. It's the most crucial in my lifetime. Right. It's about the future of our country right. and who people trust to take us forward in the future. Prime Minister, thank you. I've been getting away with it all.